everyone awake? All digested dinner, ready to go? Well, I'm going to try and speak fast because I have a one-hour talk that I'm going to fit into 45 minutes. So I'll try and rush through this a little bit. What am I going to talk about? Interaction protocols. We've heard protocols a lot. I'm going to talk about code, particularly. We all like code? Everyone like code? Yeah, so so. Slightly different code than what you think. I want to talk a little bit about the origin of the word and how it fits with protocols in particular. And we all have codes. So I like to write code, but one of my other codes is I don't like to drink bad coffee. Coffee needs to be good. And how do we get good coffee? And if you travel a lot, it can be difficult, particularly if you go to the United States. There's some really, really bad coffee in some US hotels. I'm convinced they send people on courses to make the worst possible coffee you can imagine. It's really, really dire. So how can we cope with some of this at times? Well, we can get creative. How do you make coffee when you're stuck in a hotel room and there's nothing? something good. Well, you could bring your own coffee pot. How do you heat the coffee pot? Well, there's normally an iron in a room, and maybe you can make use of your trainers that you've gone with when you take there. But, so this is kind of a fun thing to do, but it's often like how we write code. We often write code by trying to be clever. We sort of make things work together, not really how they're supposed to. So these things aren't supposed to interact like this. You're not supposed to put a coffee pot on top of your iron. It's not a really good idea. It's a bit fragile. It may fall over. It may break. You could burn the carpet. You could cover it in coffee. Like, all these sorts of things. Our code is often like this. It's often very brittle. doesn't really work very well. And we get proud of this rather than sort of thinking, how do we do better? How do we do amazing things? Well, one of the quite amazing things we did this year as an industry is we took a picture of a black hole for the first time. Now, that looks something quite simple, but that was incredibly complicated. It took five petabytes of data to generate that image. It was collected from eight different telescopes. We could have shown the image last year, but one of the reasons why we couldn't is a lot of that data came from Antarctica. And in the winter in Antarctica, they have a code where you're not allowed to land an aircraft in the middle of winter because it's kind of dangerous. And they couldn't ship the data back to be analyzed because there was so much of it. So they physically moved the hard drives, hundreds of kilos of hard drives to do that. Now think about the history that gets us to this. We need to collaborate, we need to communicate, we need to work together. We need to interact across many different disciplines. That ability to interact is really what makes humans quite unique. And we've got an interesting history to that. So I want to go through a little bit of this history and show how it applies in how we write code today. Because I want to answer a fundamental question is, how significant are protocols to software development? And if we try to do things at scale and we try to become real engineering, this becomes very key. And there's some good examples along the way. So let's look at the word protocol itself. What does it mean and what's its origin? Because as an industry, we're terrible at using words. I'm always looking stuff up in the dictionary. And like the joke about me and the book and reading is I'm dyslexic, so I struggle with writing. So I'm constantly looking stuff up to understand it. And I'm just shocked at the mistakes we make as an industry, like random access memory. Do you really want random access to your memory? Just give you any random data back? That would be stupid. We want arbitrary access to our memory. There's, our industry is littered with these really bad usages of things. So please, if you do any work in the future and you put a name on something, at least look it up in the dictionary first. <laughs> Thank you. So protocol, what is it? It's a code prescribing a strict adherence and a correct etiquette and precedence. Now, what's kind of interesting is the etiquette and precedence itself. Precedence, to me, is the most important part here that people often forget. The order in which things happen is very important. You just don't want things to happen in any order. And this is like the origin of the word. In computer science, we'll be talking about the conventions that govern the treatment and formatting of our electronic communication systems. So often we just think of formatting, we don't think of treatment. And the treatment is about the etiquette and precedence. And that's what I want to explore. So let's go way back. Evolutionary biology and communication. Like how have we successfully communicated and how we can do things as humans is fascinating. 
Because this transcends languages, it goes much further. There's lots of things that we do as humans. Let's take facial expressions, for example. Do that people who have never even seen somebody else make a facial expression knows what it means. You think, well, how can you achieve that? Well, do that blind people can show disgust, they can show shame, they can demonstrate happiness, all through facial expressions, yet they have never seen someone else do this. It's in our DNA. We have learned to do these sorts of things. We've learned to communicate, and these means of communication lets us pass on ideas and lets us coordinate in very interesting ways. And there's been a lot of study into this. So Charles Darwin did a lot of work in this area besides the origin of the species work, particularly how we react in certain ways. And this has evolved over time into what we now call manners and etiquette and some of the history of this. So etiquette is an old French word. It's used a lot around the time of Louis XIV. It means little card or little note. And it was used at the Palace of Versailles to let the dignitaries who come there know what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do, like keep off the grass. That was a little note. It tells you what you can do, what you shouldn't do. And so these are our behaviors. This is sort of governs what we do. Now, it's a great subject area. And it's worth studying, so I'm going to try and pull out a couple of the highlights of it. There's three levels to which we apply manners as human beings. The base level is what we call hygiene manners, and they're there to help prevent the spread of disease. So we will demonstrate disgust. We will distance ourselves from things that we don't find very clean, not very hygienic. This will stop disease being spread. We isolate people who we see are infected with disease. We avoid them. It's wired into us. We can't help it in many different ways. And so we can use this. How could we use this as computer scientists? Well, when we see certain things that we think shouldn't spread, we should demonstrate disgust. I've seen some really horrible code in JavaScript, and I should just demonstrate even more disgust about that because we shouldn't have let that spread. We have lots of these things in our industry where we need to think a little bit differently about it and use some of our inbuilt techniques. Courtesy is the next level up from this. And this is helps us bond as a society. So we show courtesy to others. Like, for example, let someone else eat first, sort of giving way. The idea is to bond as a society so that we show that we are not as important as the whole group. It's not about an individual, it's about the society as a whole. And we show this. And we should demonstrate these sorts of manners, and they've evolved in many different communities. The most advanced layer is the norms where we have normalized ways of behavior, and through these normalized ways of behavior, we build trust. And trust allows us to scale and be much more efficient. So people will behave in common ways, and this gives the trust, which then allows us to be more efficient. What's fascinating is how neurologically we interact with people when they don't behave in normal ways. We will actually punish people who don't fit in with our rules, our ways of working. We cannot help it. There's studies have shown that if we see people doing things wrong, we start getting these feelings we can't even control, and we try to punish them. It goes further than that. We will, as a group, typically punish people who don't punish the others in those sorts of ways. So this is kind of fascinating. It's kind of dark in some ways, but it's all about how we get efficiencies and we build trust in communities and ways of working. So this can go on, we can end up with formal protocols. And we've advanced as humans to do really quite interesting things. And right through to probably some of our most advanced protocols are our legal systems and some of our international legal systems that are out there. One example is the rules of engagement we use for warfare. You're only allowed to behave in a certain way in a war. For example, you've got to say what is acceptable is fundamental in rules of war. And that's about how we be proportionate, how we can react, how we do certain things. For example, you're not allowed to take a response to another country. It's not proportional to what they've done. 
If one country was to sink a ship of another country, it is not acceptable if you're a power with nuclear weapons to go and have a nuclear attack on our capital. That is a crime under international law, even though you could do it. So we kind of, we could better at sort of doing these things because we want to stop and we want to limit damage to ourselves. So, and a lot of what they're trying to do is create good conditions to succeed. So we want to avoid it. Loss of human life is a terrible thing. So we've got laws to do this. The Latin terms for those are just that bellum, just that bellow, and that's how to go to war rightly and how to engage in a war rightly. If you don't follow these rules, it's a technical definition between being a soldier and a murderer. So we, we get very formal with some of this, and it's, it's an interesting subject. But let's get back to concurrent and distributed systems. So we're dealing with computer systems that we want to have interact. We wanted things done at a much larger level of scale. We wouldn't have taken pictures of black holes if we just worked as individuals and never collaborated with other people. Our systems are now at a level of scale that we need to think about how things formally interact with each other if we want to scale up. And we want to sort of answer this basic question is how should our components interact when we're designing our systems? Now, one of the greatest bodies of work out there is the IETF where we specify protocols for how systems should interact. The internet is a perfect example of this. We have done things on a scale and computing through the ITF that we just would not have been able to achieve in other ways. So we specified how computers interact, the protocols, the behaviors they should have, and now we have the internet and we have the web as a result of that, which is all very cool. Now, how do we do this? We produce what are known as RFCs, requests for comments that go out. And there's some really cool ones. And for example, on the 1st of April each year, we also do a fun one. And here's one of the examples going back to 1998, where we have the Hypertax coffee pot control protocol. So my love of coffee, I kind of get interested in some of these things. And we specify how you should control a coffee pot through a protocol. Kind of interesting things. There's some nice cases in this, like how do we deal with errors? How do we deal with unusual things? For example, you can return a 418 code saying, I'm a teapot rather than a coffee pot. That is actually in the standard. <laughs> Interesting, fun stuff. There's been lots of other good examples of this. This is one of my favorites, going right back to 1980, where we were talking about how do we deal with encoding of numbers in computer systems. And someone wrote this really fun paper called The Holy War and the Plea for Peace. This is one of the fun 1st of April papers, but it's also got a lot of really good content. So I guess everyone's heard of Little Indian and little, Big Indian tile protocols. Well, what's the origin of that? Like, why do they call it Indian? Well, it's actually taken from Gulliver's Travels in Lilliput. And the two peoples in that story went to war, and they went to war over which end of the egg you eat first. Do you eat the little egg, end of the egg or the big end of the egg? That's the thing. So you become a little Indian or a big Indian style person. Now, which byte do we send first when we're encoding an integer? Well, that's the little Indian, big Indian side of this. This paper is really good fun and describes a lot of history to that, why it is, all that sort of stuff. 1980, going back for some of that. We've done other fun things like, how can we have transmission of IP datagrams over Avian characters? Carrier. So pigeons, how do we send data by pigeons? This is kind of fun thing. 1990. Notice up here you've got things like uh, it's experimental and there's errata exist. <laughs> so these things get corrected to go through the whole normal formal process. We went that further. We added quality of service later on in 99 and we updated it recently for IPv6. <laughs> <laughs> So people who do protocols also have a sense of humor sometimes. How should we document our protocols? You've seen from these previous examples, they're text-based, they're very simple in some ways. Well, often that's enough. But I find that this question comes up to a lot. And that is like the difference between an API and a protocol. We often talk about API design, and I think this is missing a huge part of what's important in communication because that covers often the formatting, it doesn't cover the precedent and the treatment. That etiquette side is way more important in many cases. So how do we specify that? Well, let's look at an example. Let's say I have a file, and I want to be able to open a file, read a write to it, and close it. What are the order in which those operations are allowed to happen? Have I just given API 
It doesn't tell me anything about the order. It doesn't tell me what are the rules I should follow, like I should call open, then I can call read or write as many times as I want, follow by a close. Well, you can do this by using simple things like regular expression style semantics. And it becomes a much cleaner way to specify something. You can then go on and enumerate what each of those calls are. But you get this nice ordering with the precedent semantic that's exposed from it. Whenever I see teams starting to do this as a way of working, their whole interaction with their system becomes much richer and much better, rather than just specifying an API. So specify a protocol rather than specify an API, and it's not complicated. It's not very elaborate in many ways. So you just keep it quite simple. So that's a very simple sort of file-based API. Some more complicated examples is some network communication. Like this is an example from a system I worked on called Aeron, whereby we make connections, we can do flow control, we deal with loss recovery on networks, and we can measure round trip times by just sending messages backwards and forwards. We can show the interactions and the orders that's allowed to happen. It gives you a picture that you can see how to do this and start to reason about it. But importantly, you've always got to ask what can possibly go wrong. You think about the scale, the way we've worked as humans in the past, things go wrong. How do we correct it? How do we think about it? This is a question I find very few people ask in software, yet it's so important. This paper is wonderful if you haven't read it. And it talks about what are the production outages that were P1 type scenarios. So we had a bug and it caused the production system to stop. Catastrophic failure, the system wasn't working. What was the cause of this? And there's loads of wonderful points in this, but the thing that stood out for me most in this was 25% of the cases where they were investigated were unhandled errors. Catching an exception, doing nothing with it. A large number of the cases they investigated, they found to-dos inside the exception handlers, saying, oh, must fix this before we go into production not been fixed. It's like, that's important. That's the thing about what can go wrong, how do you deal with it? Checking return codes, dealing with exceptions. It's a very common problem people just don't think about. But if you think about it, it really starts to improve the situation. Let's look at a more complicated example here. Now, this is a brilliant example from some of the design of protocol on a larger scale. Now, imagine you've got a system, and that system is sharing data with a lot of different clients. So, what I want to do is I want to display like a chat room, or I want to display a message board, or a video server, something like this, where you've got lots of consumers looking at the data from something, and they're needing to get that data, but there's certain problems with it. So if you add users, you have a scalability problem. How do you send the data to many different users? You've got to scale that up. Now, you can use something like TCP, and if you send data over TCP, TCP is expecting whatever transport is running on would be unreliable. So it's expecting data to be lost all the time. So it's actually quite aggressively looking for that and trying to address it. It addresses that by acknowledging all data and retransmitting if it doesn't get acknowledgments. Now, as you are users, not only are you having to scale up the sending of the data, which you can replicate out, you're having to deal with the scale up of all those acknowledgments coming back. And so you've got a, a problem here that just does not scale. The mathematics are against you. How can you solve this? Well, one way to solve it is to start using multicast rather than, say, something like TCP, so UDP multicast. So now you can push all of that distribution down into the hardware infrastructure, and you can scale really nice. It federates out. It works beautifully at that level. But then you've got the problem of what happens if you get loss. If you get lost, you need to then get it transmitted back. Well, you don't want to start acting everything because you've got the same problem as TCP. So the next obvious step is to negatively acknowledge stuff. So you send a knack. You send a knack if you get lost. You don't acknowledge everything. You just assume it's successful, but then you negatively acknowledge whenever something goes wrong and you ask for a retransmission. That does work better and is more scalable up until the point where you start to realize that a lot of loss scenarios are correlated. For example, a packet being sent out from the source server overruns a buffer that's not big enough, it gets dropped. That means everybody doesn't get it, not just one or two of the parties that are interested. So how do we start to cope with this? This becomes a difficult problem. 
where you can start having control, you can start having some sort of coordination, and many of the designs to this required sort of central control to try and arbitrate what's going on, because that's how we instinctively do things in legal scenarios, in computing scenarios. We take control of something to try and put it right. Somebody took a very different approach to this, and we ended up with, so like, how do we deal with this NAC implosion thing? So let's address this. How do I stop this? How do I do something that does not require all of this control and the problems of dealing with this? And this paper was published as a solution to this. And it's called the Reliable Multicast Framework for Lightweight Sessions and Application Framing. Now, the premise of this was actually really interesting. It was, whenever you see loss, you don't just send back a thing going, I've had loss, please send me the data again. What you do is you note the fact that you've seen loss and you set a random timer. And the random timer is based upon how long it typically takes to do a round trip to the server. And so you just set it at a couple of factors greater than that, and you wait. And you wait to see, does the data get retransmitted? Whenever your negative, or whenever your timer goes off, you see, has the data been retransmitted in the meantime? And if it hasn't been retransmitted, then you send the negative acknowledgement. So you've randomized when you go to send it. Now imagine a large population get the same scenario where the data hasn't been delivered. If they were all to send back the negative acknowledgement, you just get a storm of NACs coming in. You get a storm of retransmissions. That would become really messy. By waiting for the random time, the random timer goes off. The first one for the random timer to go off sends the NAC back, just the one. The data gets retransmitted. Everybody who's missed it gets it. And then whenever their timers go off, they realize they've already got the data, and they don't send again. This is a very different approach. No, there's no centralized control. It's using the ability to use random generation of numbers for the timings, and coordination not through centrally, but by having behavior considering what else may be going on in the world at that point in time. Whenever I first seen this protocol, I thought this was just genius, really scalable, no central point of control, no central point of failure, scales very nicely and works really well. How did someone come up with this? So I started looking into the backgrounds of some of the people. And if you look at the list of people who are authors on this, the first one on that paper you'll find is a, a lady called Sally Floyd. And Sully Floyd, if you look into her history, she's got a PhD in computer science. She's got advanced degrees in mathematics and computer science and stuff. So you kind of think, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, this is going to be the kind of background. You step back one further. Her undergraduate degree was not in mathematics or computer science. Her undergraduate degree was in sociology. That was fascinating. Somebody who actually studied how societies and soci uh, sociology works were able to come up with a very different style of algorithm that worked. And this, to this day, is one of the best algorithms for dealing with this uh, whole space. The two names you'll see there at the beginning, Sully Floyd and Van Jacobson, are the main reason the internet works today. Because in the 1980s, we suffered congestion collapse, and the computer scientists couldn't work it out. And these two, through work they were doing on physics at the time, wanted the internet to work so they could share data, and they fixed it pretty much for us by introducing congestion control to TCP and doing lots of great work. There's lots of other things that they've done since then. So it kind of works because of this. Others took this further and thought, well, rather than just setting a random timer, because originally that work was done, it was done with a normal distribution. What if we took control of that distribution a bit? How about if we skewed it towards the back of the time period? So we've done an exponentially distributed distribution, but we cut off the front of it enough so the probability is high of something being sent soon in a reasonably large population. Could we get even better results? And that's what this paper went on to show us as well. But again, no central control. Using mathematics, using coordination at scale, could do really nice things. I've implemented both of these algorithms and I've seen firsthand how well they work. And yet I've worked in other algorithms that are kind of very unpleasant and very control-based and they don't give us the same results. I'll come back to one of those later. So that's a little flavor for protocols. What's all involved in it and what should we focus on? Well, it's kind of a huge subject. Lots of things to consider inside protocols. I'm going to pick out a few things, see how they sort of apply and understand, because I'm not going to try and cover everything. I don't have enough time. But first
first of all, let's ask a question. Who cares about waste? A few people. Do most people know that our data centers are now consuming more energy globally than the airline industry? Just our data centers? I'm not talking about phones, home computers, everything, other sort of devices, just our data centers? We have vast amount of energy wasted in this. I get to profile many real-world applications and see where we spend our time, where we waste our CPU cycles and where we burn that energy. And here's something to consider. Tax-based codex is something I've seen from profiling firsthand is one of our biggest wastes. We encode stuff in JSON, we encode stuff in XML, and I'm going to express my disgust at our industry for this. Getting back to some things, we should not be doing this. It's really, really inefficient and really, really wasteful. We can use binary codecs instead that are not 10, 20, 30 percent faster, or multiple orders of magnitude faster and more efficient as a way of working. But people be going, but, 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 but it's human readable. We like tax. I'm going to call bullshit on that. I know a handful of people who can read ASCII. And I work with people who do protocols all of the time. I know no one who can read U2F8. We have editors that allow us to do that, and we can see it through our editors. So we have tools. We don't read the underlying binary. We need better tools to read some of the other binary protocols. And there are techniques out there for doing this. So we're kind of focusing on the wrong problem. We're just taking our hammers and we're beating screws in rather than actually trying to do proper engineering and thinking about doing that. So that's kind of a little plea, but just have to show my disgust. And if you do binary protocols, you can get to do pretty ASCII art. This is one of mine from a protocol I worked on where we get to draw out how data is laid out. And then we can write tools to be able to read that and deal with it very efficiently and cleanly, like reading fields using two to three instructions rather than thousands and thousands of instructions that are expensive to deal with our tax-based disgusting stuff that we put on the wire. What can we do for this? So examples like SBE, flop buffers, Cap and Proto, SM1, there's good examples of how to do binary protocols out there, but instead we just want all these JSON and XML and whatever. And then, by the way, JSON is not a step forward from XML. At least we had types in XML. We don't seem to even have that in JSON now. Thank you. Versioning. This is another really interesting thing. So when we're communicating, do we know the version of the conversation we're having, like building these in, so some fundamentals and protocols. So at a high level, we need a little version. What conversation are we having? That's very useful. It's good to know that. The internet deals with this very well. Most applications sort of do. We drop down from that is, do we version our messages within that? So can we extend our messages? Can we do backwards compatibility? Can we upgrade systems partially and so the things that we're having to do today, this becomes important. But more interestingly is versioning of state. Many people don't do this. They're not even aware that it's possible and the benefits that it gives us. Like at a simple level, if you work in consensus algorithms, one example of this is you have to vote in elections and you want to make sure that a vote that's coming in is for the current election, not for some previous election in time and the packet got lost and delayed, maybe because the machine took a garbage collection pause or took a weird route through a network or it started up again and replayed something that it shouldn't have. By putting the versions on these things, things become relevant, they get applied to the right thing. Pretty sort of simple stuff. But it gets more complicated, and uh, a brilliant example I find is working on concurrent data structures. People who write protocols that go on to networks are kind of getting this, and they're building this in. This becomes a known thing. But in concurrent data structures, people often aren't. But it really helps if you do. Many-to-many -many queues are a really difficult problem in our industry to do it well and do it efficiently. And I've researched this a lot. I've written a number of them myself. And I made a lot of the mistakes. And I try to work around and realize that you get all these mistakes because things are not the versions you expect them to be. It's really kind of nice to know this. But I didn't really work out how to do it. And then I came across this particular website, 1024cores.net by Dmitry Yukov. He's based out of Moscow. And he had come up with a many-to-many -many queue where he versioned every state change in it. And that had a little bit of an overhead, 
But what it did to simplify things, it actually made a much more efficient, much simpler overall data structure because he just put versioning on everything. It's a kind of beautiful example of saying this. If you're interested, go have a look at that. Synchronous versus asynchronous communication. This one I find comes up an awful lot. Let's look at what happens when we communicate synchronously. We send a message, we get a response. We send a message, we get a response. Send a message, get a response. Notice how time is going out as we're dealing with that. Let's increase the latency. Something's further away over us, slower network. We send a request, we get a response. Send a request, get a response. Uh-oh, I can't do my three calls because I've run out of time. It's become a problem. We're coupled to time. We're temporally coupled in the design by making things synchronous. And what's happening here is we're also blocking the system. We're having to get the operating system involved, putting threads asleep, getting them back. We're trying to work around this by adding fibers, by adding futures, all of these things that are dealing with the complexity of that. So we're dealing with symptoms rather than dealing with the true underlying problem. Where if we think about it synchronous, asynchronous, like we send a request, we send another request, we send another. Then we start getting the responses back. We can get things done much more quickly, much more efficiently. If we increase the latency, what happens? We send our requests and then the responses start to come back. And look, we don't get impacted by time so much. We've decoupled ourselves much more from time by thinking about doing things asynchronously. But what's happening here is we're doing non-blocking calls. So if there's nothing to do, we can go do something else, which is kind of nice. We can get more efficient with that. And we can track what's going on by just using state machines, which is something people should really go study. And that's another huge, wonderful subject in its own right, rather than the new shiny whatever. But again, you get this, but, 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 synchronous is so much easier. Again. I don't think this is true at any level of scale. It's simpler in simple examples, but it doesn't scale because the complexities that you bring in with the temporal coupling and the failure cases makes it much more complicated. The problem is like, we were, we're drawn to things that let us make progress quickly, but then we just deal with complexity later. Where sometimes we need to do a little bit more fundamental work up front, and then things get easier in the long term. How we overcome some of that in the modern world is an interesting challenge. If you're designing systems like this, think about the fact that synchronous means that things are blocking. You're stopped. You can't make progress. This limits what's going on. Well, you can break this by sort of managing that state by feedback. And this is going back to fundamental theory. Claude Shannon talked about this in the 1940s on information theory and how we deal with it. We have to manage feedback. We've got to manage whenever things go wrong. It's the, what can go wrong? People make these calls and they expect them to fail. How about we just make them and we make dealing with the failure cases just explicit and something that's normal in the state machine. And we can make it easier by wrapping this stuff up so we can design an asynchronous API, we can then wrap it with a synchronous API to sort of kind of weed the people off it who they don't want to change so quickly, and that's fine. Some people change at a different pace than others, but eventually we've got to show enough disgust that they maybe start coming the right way and start doing the right sorts of things and get a bit better at this. And we can see this even in the history of our protocols that we're using on the internet. So things that we tried RPC, we then have HP and it goes over TCP. These are fundamentally the wrong protocols for what we're using them for today. Like HTTP is for fetching documents, yet we're building applications. RPC, every generation realizes it's a bad idea, and then the next generation has another go at it again. And we keep going around, we keep making the same mistakes, and maybe we will learn. We keep running at that wall with spikes. Sooner or later, some generation is going to say, stop running at the wall with spikes. It hurts and people die. <laughs> it's just not good. And like, so how are we learning within the protocol community? So TCPs had evolved to have TCP fast open, trying to get around some of the synchronous issues. We're now moving to protocols like Quick. 
Like if you're using a Google browser talking to a Google service, you are not using TCP anymore. It's not really a suitable protocol for that. We use UDP with quick running over the top of that. It's a much better fit. Like we had HTTP 1.1, we went with speedy, then we go to HTTP 2. And the idea is like, let's, let's stop being synchronous. We need to go asynchronous with how we work. We made some mistakes with HTTP 2 because we didn't think about the failure cases, what can go wrong. And the fact that we only have one connection and if it dies, our browser pages don't render progressively. So we're having to fix that now with HTTP 3. And we've seen various things with TLS as well over time. And the latest 1.3 is actually a really quite nice piece of work. But the people who produce these sometimes forget that people who use these systems don't know the engineering facts that this is based upon. Example of this is we have an optimization now in TLS 1.3 where we can connect without doing extra round trips. So zero round trip connect to a server. But this is vulnerable to replay attacks if people haven't put versioning information in their protocols. Where if they put versioning information, they get a replay, they know they've already dealt with it and they throw it away. If they haven't, so you get a debit to your bank account and you haven't given it a unique identifier and you get the the debit again, well, if you just debit the account, you've got a problem. But if you put a version in everything, you don't have a problem with certain responsibilities. Batching is another really good example here. So think about the etiquette of requests and how we behave as humans. So get invited around to a friend's house, and you go to have dinner. And when you arrive, they say, can you help here? I need some milk to make the dinner and I've forgotten it, can you run to the shop? So you, you say, good friend, I'll run to the shop, I get the milk, I bring it back. You get back, and they said, do you know what, I could do with a bit more milk. Could you please go to the shop again, I forgot. And so you send them off to the shop again, you get a bit more milk, they come back again. And then they come back again, and say, do you know what, I actually need more milk and some cheese. You're going to start having a bad relationship with your friend. Your, your good friend has now become this annoying person that's just demanding these things off you. Yet, we don't do that because our instincts stop us doing these things. We have some basic ways how we interact as humans. We don't apply that to computers. We just keep telling computers to do the same stupid things over and over again because it's an inanimate object. We don't care about it. It doesn't matter. It's got no feelings, whatever. It's kind of interesting. If you twist it around and you project that it does have feelings, you'll actually treat it a bit better. That's a little bit of the origin of mechanical sympathy and how I approach stuff. Because let's face it, one day when the computers do become sentient and take over the world, I'm kind of hoping in that they're going like, to leave me and don't kill me and they can kill everybody else who made them process Jason all that time. <laughs> and you kind of deserve all that you get. You made me do HTTP with Jason over and over again. <laughs> You're going to get tortured as a result. <laughs> We'll stop it. <laughs> and, but it matters, because as we go to 100 gigabit Ethernet now, we can't use our current APIs. They don't scale. The BSD sockets API does not work with 100 gig Ethernet. The system call overhead is too high. It doesn't work. So we're getting other APIs, other protocols, other ways of working. We're moving to batch-based things. We need to, so if you're gonna go to the shops, you sort of ask for enough things in one go. Don't go one by one by one. Go to the shop and get three liters of milk, please, rather than sort of go get three individual liters of milk. We need to do these things because then we get much better scale and it works more efficiently. Now, I promised snake oil protocols before I finish. So we you see this a lot, and there's a number of examples of this. We're very prone to doing things that make our life easy, some things we just want to do because it makes our life easy. And vendors prey upon that. They say, you buy our product and we'll take away a whole pile of problems. And so we're easily suckered into this. But it's often wrong and we're doing the wrong things. A good example of this is two-phase commit of the XA protocol. Now, the lure of this is very tempting. It's like, just use this and you don't need to deal with most of your distributed systems problems. The first time I seen XA in the 1990s, I thought, okay, we can deal with failure cases, but it's something that jumped out to me. What about the transaction coordinator? What if it dies? Does it work? Well, no, it doesn't. And I remember asking vendors, and they're like, oh, no, just don't talk about this. These are big vendors with a few letters in their name just. <laughs> and kind of see the problems where some of this come from. And they're just peddling this really terrible software, but everybody kind of believed it 
I managed to convince clients, actually here in Germany, that it was a bad idea to use some of this software and then discovered later on that all of my advice was completely ignored where some salesperson from the senior company ended up doing a deal on a golf course with the senior person in another organization and it just ended up happening. But People who have really looked into these protocols understand some of the fundamentals. This is a great paper by Jim Gray and Leslie Lamport looking into some of our transaction protocols. And I can say, like, don't go with something like two-phase. It's actually formally proven to be incorrect, but because it's got all these single failure cases, I felt so vindicated reading this later on and realizing that, oh, there actually is real problems, and I spotted it, and some smarter people than me actually seen it and confirmed it as well, which is kind of cool. And we see this as well with things like messaging and guaranteed delivery. Like anybody who tells you their messaging system is guaranteed delivery, it's just bullshit. <laughs> it is not the case. And anybody who wants to talk about that with me afterwards, very happy to discuss further. Because we need to think about what are our feedback, what are recovery protocols. These are things we do in real life. We compensate things are imperfect, we deal with it, we deal with it in better different ways. And we've got to think about, we're building on top of stuff. We've got to understand what's it capable of? Is it giving us the right sorts of things? So quickly now to wrap up. Are protocols really significant to software development? Are they the important thing that's there for us? Quick question. Who recognizes this protocol? Come on, we're in Germany. We should have a number of people who knows what this is. It's a scientific method. We follow very simple protocols to how we do stuff. Question, hypothesis, prediction, experiment, analysis. Originally put forward by Sir Francis Bacon, popularized by Isaac Newton. This is one of the most powerful tools we have as humans for learning and acquiring knowledge. And I love this part of it particularly, falsifiability. Now, how can we apply this in computer science? I'll give you a really simple example. Let's say someone reports a bug in the system. So some customer calls in, you've got a bug, you want to report this. The first thing you should do is write a test that illustrates that bug. Now why do it like this? Because if you write the test that illustrates the bug, you have just falsified that the system meets its requirements. You've shown through scientific approach that the system does not meet its requirements. It's falsified because of this bug gets tripped up and the test proves it. Now you fix the system and you run your tests again and the test passes. It's gone the right sort of way. Now you flip it around the other way, you go fix the system, you write the test. Does it work or not? You don't know. That ordering, that precedence is so important to get this stuff right. And that kind of really helps with how we go about it. And we see this in many different ways. Conway's Law is a perfect example of this. The communication flows within an organization reflect in the software. And if you want to have really good software, you gotta think about how do you fix the communication flows in your organization first? Because things that are well separated in the teams, teams that are nice and cohesive, that communicate well, that know how to communicate well with other teams with low coupling and don't have the temporal issues and stuff, it reflects in software. So the stuff that we should be practicing just in our working lives, shows itself in software and it becomes a very interesting way to deal with things. And on that, I'll thank you very much because I'm just out of time. Thank you, Martin. I think there's one question that might interest a lot of people. Sure. Um, you said it was less wasteful to use binary codecs. What about using a text codec with a compression during transport? Very good question. So using text uh, with compression. It's a bit like, so let's say you're a meth addict and you sort of give up and you are a heroin addict and let's go to methadone. That's kind of what you're doing with compression. You're kind of masking the problems, you're making it a little bit better. We're actually, just get over it. Maybe that's a migration strategy, maybe it's a way to work. Binary is so much more efficient and so much cleaner. Now you may compress on top of binary, but just dealing with uh, different protocols. Like one of the things we're seeing a lot in the modern world that has changed and people haven't become aware of is our CPUs have not been getting significantly faster. 
but all of our memory subsystems, all of our communication subsystems have all got much higher bandwidth. So focusing on compression tends to not be the right thing. There was a time, like through our industry, decades of time where that was a really good thing. In the modern industry, we don't tend to have very much bandwidth issues anymore. Now you do in some cases over mobile networks and various things, but within data centers, within other things, you don't tend to get bandwidth issues. So I think compression is a kind of misleading thing. Like I can decode an integer in binary format in one instruction, and that one instruction will only take one cycle to run. If I'm going to deal with an integer encoding in text, I have to write loops running hundreds of instructions to do the very simple decoding of a text-based protocol. It's just not efficient in comparison. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.